You brought the jelly bellies. I did. I love those. Am I on? Aren't you guys glad that our pastor is back for, uh, to, to, to teach us? <laughs> is that like dinner? We're, no, this is the first question. This just, is the first question. Just to warm us up for one minute. Pastor right. Jeff, what is your favorite jelly belly flavor? Mm. Favorite. You know, actually, I'm a purist. I like the licorice. Licorice. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Any other licorice fans in the house? Like, oh, wow. Yeah. I think yeah. they're just... I, you know, I'm like, can I retract that? Sure. There's one in there that's like pineapple. It's really good, too. Okay. You can have it, but you have to turn off your microphone while you chew. No, uh, I, I, I can't uh, at all. My favorite is the uh, toasted marshmallow. Toasted and marshmallow. And the, um, the coconut with the little speckles. That's really good. So. The buttered popcorn is also really good now that I think about oh, it. Oh, man. What, that's disgusting. Seriously. That's oh, horrible. I don't know. I'm not sure you can be my pastor anymore. <laughs> I think you did this to tempt me. I did. Get thee behind me, Satan. There you go. Um, well, our, our first question tonight is actually a lot more sinister than Jelly Bellies, and it does have something to do with what Pastor Jeff just said about Satan. Um, as, we, as I ask this question, just be aware that you can text your questions in. They're getting compiled into a list, so that's the number on the screens, or if you're watching on live stream, it's probably on the bottom underneath my feet. Um, and to just text to that, and we will um, try to answer as many of your questions tonight. The, the first question we're going to take a crack at, or he's going to take a crack at, I'm just going to listen attentively, is um, can demons attack the minds of born-again Christians? Can Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, we, we have several different passages of Scripture that really kind of give us a, a glimpse, an insight, if you will, into the limited power that not just demons, but Satan himself actually has. And so maybe we can step this up a notch and we'll throttle it back. Now, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 actually gives us a little bit of insight that it is only God, God alone, that knows the human heart or the human mind. And furthermore, one of the things I think we need to remember is that when you're talking about uh, Satan or a demon or any, any one of those demonic forces, they are not as God is. They're not omniscient. They're not omnipotent. They cannot know all things. They don't know all things. They're not all powerful. And they can't be everywhere at once. And so very often when you think about your mind, you have to remember that your mind is actually attached to your body. Um, it is actually a computer designed by God. Um, it's made up of cells. It's made up of a system that includes neurons and all those kind of things. So Satan can attack the human mind, but he does not know your thoughts. In other words, he has the capacity to understand what you are doing, but he cannot just simply reach into your mind and implant things in there uh, that, that are unrestrained by God. God alone has the power to control our minds. Um, when you think uh, of, of God himself, even Jesus actually said, I think it's in Matthew chapter 9, uh, that, that God knew the thoughts of, of the disciples before they thought them, that he knew the mind of the people before. In other words, he knows our thoughts before we know our thoughts. And so it seems to me that Scripture indicates that only God can know the thoughts. And so the second and subsequent question is, how much power do demons have? And really where people usually go with this is actually, can, can a Christian be demon-possessed, or can a Christian, or is it clear that Christians can't, and can they then uh, have their minds actually affected by demonic forces? And so that's kind of a, a thing where we talk about the difference between uh, possession and oppression. And those two things are very, very different. If you're looking at what demons can do, because how many of you in here believe that one of the things that happened to you when you gave your life to Christ is you became indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Uh, how many of you believe that the Holy Spirit is a he? It's not an impersonal force like, you know, some Jedi thing. It's actually the third person of the Trinity. You were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So when we hear greater is he who's in you than he who's in this world, the he who's in this world is actually Satan himself, who is the most powerful of these forces of darkness. 
And so a Christian cannot be possessed by a demon or a demonic spirit or even Satan himself should Satan decide that he wants to somehow uh, come and take up residence because you are already indwelt by the actual third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit himself. So there is no possibility that a Christian can be demon-possessed. So you hang a no vacancy sign on your heart. Yeah, just tell them you're, you're already taken. Mm-hmm. That you, you don't want any of it. Mm-hmm. That's why we have the capacity, by the way. When James says resist the devil and he'll flee, there's a reason why. Because you literally have the power of God within you to resist the devil. And, and so can you be, can you be afflicted? Can, can the enemy uh, press thoughts towards you? Can you put yourself in a situation where the enemy is able to bombard your mind uh, with garbage. That's French for garbage, by the way. <laughs> uh, of course. Of course the enemy can throw thoughts at you. That's called temptation. But temptation is always up to you, for Scripture declares there is no temptation that is common, that it, such that it is not common to man, and in it there's a way of escape. In other words, the enemy cannot make you sin. And the Apostle James actually goes on to say, let no one say when he sins that he sins of God, for God cannot be tempted. So the greater one that's in you automatically wins that fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Ephesians 6 talks about the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. So he is, like imagine shooting a Nerf gun at you, not the devil. Like Pastor Jeff said, I think that's a, a good distinction that it's not the devil He's in one place. He's at, in one at, place. At, at any given point of time. Yep. So that the devil's not at your door breathing down your neck, but there are demons that have been assigned. Uh, the powers, the principalities. Um, the powers, the, the rulers, the darkness yeah. of this age. So there's a whole kind of like, uh, what's the word? But like an ar- like hierarchy. A hierarchy, thank yep. you, of, of demonic forces. And there are, I mean, I don't know if this is true or not, but is it true that there are maybe some that are kind of like assigned to bother one or two particular people, or is it kind of, how does it work? I think the, the, the key there is that when we read of Satan's fall in Isaiah 14, we, and then uh, John in the book of Revelation reminds us that a third of the angels, when Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him, so he does have some forces. He's, he's got some uh, demonic resources at his, at his uh, beck and call, but they are limited. And in fact, in the book of Job, we actually see that Satan at least has some limited access to question God. Because God actually speaks to him. As crazy as it sounds, he said, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is none like him on the face of the earth. And so we do know that Satan is powerful, but he is in no way, shape, or form an equal for any one of the three members of the Godhead, the Trinity. Uh, he, He is always at a loss. Jesus himself repelled Satan himself by merely speaking the word when the Holy Spirit took him into the wilderness uh, to be tempted. And so Satan says, here's the kingdoms of the world. Mm -hmm. What did he say? Man shall not live by bread. You know, you turn these stones to bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What happened at the end of those three temptations? The devil fled. The devil fled. And what did the devil attack? Attack the bind? attack the spirit and attack the body of Jesus and each time all the word of the Lord was um, no Mm -hmm. so say no yeah just say no to Satan (laughs) amen kind of like drugs I I think I think it's important to realize you know in the western world we don't see a lot of like you know hocus pocus spooky demonic Mm -hmm. stuff Um, but I think and I think There's a a quote by C.S. Lewis, who all of you know or should know. He talks about how um, the devil's strategy in the West is to make make people not even think he's real. It's like when when they start to get an idea that maybe there's something demonic going on, just put that silly idea of the devil with the red pitchfork in their heads, and then they'll go, Mm. oh, it's all silly. It's not even real. This is just, but it's a real thing. And I'm not saying we should all be afraid and, you know, check behind our door before we go to bed or whatever. But I think as Christians, we should realize that there is a spiritual battle going on, raging on constantly around us. Yeah, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be invited to put on the whole armor of God and, and resist the devil if he wasn't real. Amen? So he is real, but as, as the Apostle John said there in 1 John 4, he said, Dear children, you're from God. <laughs> you're from God. 
and you've overcome them, speaking of the wicked ones. The one who is in you is greater than the one who's in this world. That, that's so important for us to remember. We, we are on the winning side. There is no weapon fashioned against you that can prosper, says the Lord. And so you need to walk in that victory. I think a lot of times we give so much credit to the devil and to demons that we don't seize the power that we have in Christ. Seize the power that you have in Christ. It doesn't mean you aren't going to experience some attacks from time to time, uh, but you ought to be winning. Amen? Because you have one in him. What do we got next? Awesome. Uh, so next we have a question that just came in through text message. And we're going to open it up to the floor here in a second. So if you have a question uh, on the floor, just raise your hand and Pastor Dave will bring the mic over to you. So the, the question that came in through text is, um, if a Christian falls back into sin, should he be baptized again after repenting? That's a great, um, that, that's a really, really, really good question. My answer to that is it's a wonderful sign that you've pushed the reset button. Um, I, I, think it, I think it is. And though baptism, remember what it is the first time. It's an outward sign of your commitment to follow Christ, to walk in the Spirit, that you've been washed by the Lord, you've been cleansed from your sin. And if those around you know that you've stumbled, know that you've fallen, know that you've been places where you shouldn't be, and there is a witness in your life that's contrary to who you are in Christ, one of, the, one of the great ways for you to announce to the world, I'm done with that and I'm going to go the right way, is to be baptized again. Yeah, and there, even though it should be sufficient one time, uh, I myself have been baptized once and exactly once. Uh, and, and though I, I can tell you there was a time in my life I probably would have taken my own counsel and said, you know, I probably need to do that again. Um, but it's a, it's a good thing. Is it necessary for salvation? Absolutely not. Um, but is it a great sign to people around you that you're, you're, you want to reignite uh, that passion with the Lord? Absolutely, yes. Mm. It, but it's not something that, like, we should do every time we fall into sin. Because no. that would be like every day I would have to jump in a pool, <laughs> you know. We just keep a pool right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you and I could be the first ones to jump in. Oh, yeah, for sure. We just have kind of like our little baptismal here. No, they, and, and this is another issue of theology. You know, there, there are two prevailing views, and the church has fought over it since the Reformation. When you have Calvinism on one side, Arminianism on the other, and you have uh, Calvinism it teaches a very strict understanding that you're eternally secure and basically there's, there's no possibility of losing your salvation. And Arminianism teaches that reg regularly, frequently, and often you actually become unsaved. So every time you sin and you sin willingly, you need to get saved again. And that obviously is contrary to, to Christ's uh, commands himself that says it is enough that you have been washed. And so uh, it, it is really important that we maintain a sinless life as best as we possibly can. And when there's been a major deviation from that, we ought to make a public proclamation for the good because we've made a public proclamation for the bad. Um, but please don't feel like you need to get baptized every week and please don't feel like you need to get saved every week because he who is in you is greater than he's in this world. Amen. Yeah, and you taught about you know when Jesus came to wash all the disciples' feet, and Peter said no, right. and and he said if I if I wash you, you will, if I don't wash you, you won't have any part with me, um, and then he said then everything, and he said no, just it's let me sprinkle your feet a few, you know. <laughs> so the 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 key concept that we really should encourage is that when you fall into sin, it, you should confess to the Lord, and even this isn't probably an underutilized command of Scripture, but confess to one another that you might be healed, you yeah. know? And so um, I confess to people when I sin. Um, it's not like you wanna, we're not talking to, you know, become Catholic and go to a confessional or anything, but just have some people in your life that when you fall in an area, you, you go to those people and you say, hey, I, I blew it in this area and I just wanna tell you so that I don't continue in sin because sin thrives in the darkness. And when you bring it out to the light, it loses its power, so. Amen, amen, amen. All right, there's another question here that um, is, is tied into baptism, though, and I okay. think it would be behoove us just to hit it real quick. It says, uh, can I do communion if I haven't been baptized? You want to answer that one? I would say yes. Um, You're correct. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jesus made no stipulations on, on whether you could take 
communion, save your saved. In other words, part of there are two ordinances that Jesus himself passed along to the church. One of them is baptism and the other one is communion. He made no connection, connection between the two. Uh, and, and again, I don't want to turn this into a, a bashing, but there are theological bents that tie those things together in a way that Scripture does not tie them together. And in fact, uh, I think it's really dangerous to do that because ultimately then it becomes about one work being necessary for another work to actually be able to be uh, effective in your life. That'd be kind of like saying, well, as long as you have forsaken any and all sin of every flavor, then you're okay with God. But if you have this one, you're not. And so it's, a, it's another important part. You, you want to have close fellowship communion. In other words, you, you should only be baptized uh, knowing full well that you intend to keep the commitment that you're making a public pronouncement of your faith, and you should participate at the Lord's table because you have confessed your sin and you're acknowledging. Remember, Jesus said the reason that we're to take communion, do this in remembrance of me, not do this in remembrance of you or do this in remembrance of your baptism, but do this in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. So can I ask a uh, follow-up? Like, no. If, no. No. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I think a, uh, an important question to ask the person is, is why wouldn't you be baptized, though? You know, if you've, if you've accepted the Lord, right. why wouldn't you be baptized? You think about the, uh, you, the Ethiopian eunuch. As, so, yeah. as soon as he understood Christ in the Scripture, he was like, hey, look, there's water. Let's jump in. And he got baptized. And it's a command. It's like the first step is faith, and then the first command of obedience is to be baptized, right? So... Baptism should be a part of every believer's life. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we, we, you can downplay it and you can make it more important than it actually is. The two errors are that baptism is, is absolutely essential for salvation. That is taught nowhere in Scripture. Right, the thief on the cross went straight to paradise and he didn't have time to get dunked. No, he didn't get baptized. He, yeah, nothing happened to him other than he died and went to paradise. Right. So we have that example. And, and the same is true when you're talking about, talking about communion. So those two things are your own personal relationship with the Lord. They should be immediate acts of obedience. Dave, questions? Right here. Good evening. Good evening. I, I understand there is three different dispensations. Dispen dispensation of Adam and Eve, dispensation of the law, and the dispensation of the grace. Mm -hmm. The dispensation of the grace, did it start on the book of Matthew, or did it start until Jesus died? And I think a, a really important, so he's talking about the three basic dispensations, Adam and Eve, um, and then what was the second one, Dave? The law. The law. The law. Okay, the law that came through Moses. The law of Moses. Law of Moses, and then the dispensation of grace. The word dispensation is important that you understand it if you're going to use that word. It simply means economy. And economy is, is the way that things are discerned and understood with regard to their relative cost. And so when we talk about the dispensation of grace, the, the economy is the economy of grace. So where did grace start? Grace actually began in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 1, in the beginning God... And so it is continued, and you see actually the grace of God is actually visible in Genesis chapter 3. Um, we have the promise of the grace of God in Genesis chapter 7. Um, so the grace of God, the, the dispensation is how we understand it. It's not actually a function of how God was, God was intending us to believe. We have always believed by faith resulting in God's grace. And so grace itself, the plan of grace, really was made effective at the cross. When Jesus said, to tell us die, it is finished, um, grace was available then. And I think that's the easier way to understand it. Instead of there being different ways that God dealt with humankind, which is true. He dealt with, he dealt, there was a covenant with Noah. There was a covenant with David. Um, there was certainly Adam and Eve's understanding prior to the flood. And so we call those things economies of how God dealt with humankind. 
and those economies were true that in the time of, say, that we're studying now, Abraham, uh, you had Abraham's understanding of grace. Well, Abraham's understanding of grace is he died and he went to Abraham's bosom. He went to his, the place named after him called Sheol and he waited for Jesus to complete and bring us into the age of grace. And so the answer to your question really is look at it as the age of grace, which continued from the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross to this day and time. Mm -hmm. You kind of broke the question because you said there's three, three but there's actually none because it's all grace interwoven. And it it's all faith, faith forward. So the, the saints of the Old Testament had faith forward towards the cross, though they didn't fully know the details of it, and, this, and uh, we saints today had fa have faith backwards towards the cross. Yeah, strict dispensational thinking, and that's what this is, it's a theological bent. Strict dispensationalism says that this is how you define how God worked at that period of time. That economy uh, was, was this, this economy and how God worked through Moses. In other words, we understood the law, we kept the law, and so that was the economy of God at that time. But at the end, the law couldn't save. The Apostle Paul says that. So you're looking forward to, you're always looking forward to the finished work. And really, you see the beginnings of grace in the book of Genesis. Cool. Any other questions? From yep, we got one right here. Good evening, pastors. Um, my question goes back to two studies, uh, Genesis 19.8. Uh, uh -huh. Why did Lot risk the life of his daughters instead of the men? That is a fantastic question. Why did Lot risk the lives of his daughters uh, over the men? Um, I have heard that explained about four or five different ways, and I've never really come to uh, a clear understanding myself. But I think it is linked directly to the culture uh, of the time. And, you, and this is going to sound terrible in our Western culture. It's going to sound really, really, really terrible. Um, up until Jesus declaring that, there, that we've all been made one in Christ, in other words, that there, Apostle Paul put it this way, there's no male, there's no female, for we are all one in Christ, there was really an understanding that the ladies were, generally speaking, though it was not God's plan, the society taught that the women were actually less important than the men. And so there's a very negative connotation to that particular side of it. And it shows the sin of Sodom. And remember that the problem there was they should not have been in Sodom in the first place. And they, they, Lot should have had the, the consciousness of the Lord uh, to move his family out. So now he's stuck again in a compromising situation where, where he's going to have to choose the lesser of two evils. And God doesn't want us choosing any evil. He wants us rejecting all evil. So it was, I believe it was, a, it was a value issue based on the society at the time, and it was not good. Yeah, I think it's important to understand that the Bible, it doesn't condone everything that happens in the Bible. It just narrates what happened in the Bible. And it's, it's just, in this instance, it's narrating a, a sinful societal concept that women were less... Chattel. Yeah, very, they were property, property to be done what you want with. Yep. Um, but I think as we're talking about the topic of, of women, I think it's important to realize that uh, New Testament paradigm shift is it's a massive jump. Like, it might not seem uh, like a massive jump to us in our, in our society, but Jesus super elevated the value of women. Um, in fact, you know, women would go around with him in his ministry. They would provide for him. Uh, it, even the eyewitnesses of the resurrection were women. The first eyewitnesses of the resurrection were women. And the, and the gospel authors actually wrote that down for us, which at the time, women were not uh, valid eyewitnesses. They couldn't be, couldn't be used, in, used court. in court. Right? And so um, Jesus elevates the value of women. The apostle Paul elevates the value of women. Um, he, he works very closely with them, Lydia and others. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was, it was broken, a broken society back then. Uh, in Lot's time. Um, it's still a broken society yeah. today. but it, It's another situation, much like in our passage here in chapter 20, where when you move into a place like that, you begin to adopt the pagan way of life that you're surrounded with. That's why it's so important for us to be separated unto God. That's what a saint is, a separated one, one who is called out. Uh, and so it, it's a sign of how bad a society can become. Yeah. yeah. Ready? Here we go. We're coming back over. 
Why did God pick Earth to have us live on it? And what does he do with the rest of the universe? Why did God pick Earth to have us live on it? it that's a great question, by the way. Um, I, I think the simple answer is this. It's the only place like it in the entire universe. We're, we're told of no other place. And in fact, when he created this place, we're told that he made it unique and he only populated it and so when we think of the rest of the universe, a lot of our understanding of the rest of the universe um, pretty much comes from an understanding of science fiction. In other words, we, we have been told that there is a possibility that there are, well, the new view is the multiverse. We were actually talking about this last week, that there could be levels of different, you know, different universes that exist simultaneously in the same space, and could God do those kinds of things? Um, the simple fact of the matter is, is we don't know of any other place in the entire universe where there is life. We do know that this particular planet, and we've, we've actually confirmed this through astrophysics, um, we've been studying the distant heavens now, uh, really in, in, a, in a very, very, very minuscule way. In other words, looking out at the universe uh, that's near us. And to this day and time, there's not a single habitable planet uh, anywhere within our detectable distance to where life would be possible. We keep having these things thrown out like, you know, we've now found water on Mars, but what they're not saying is, well, we haven't actually found water, we've actually found the possibility that there's ice and we don't know whether it's carbon dioxide or a whole bunch of other things, but having some precursor chemicals to life is not life itself, and, and we see that everywhere in the rest of the universe that we can actually see, and there's no possibility for life. When you talk about humankind, um, we are very, very, very unique, very specific gravity. Um, we, we have systems in our bodies that are so monumentally complex that they have to exist in their entirety. And in fact, we're going to probably do a, we'll do a creation science night or something and cover those things. So we don't know about any other places in the rest of the universe uh, because God has chosen to make us so specifically unique and created us in his image. And he planted us here. Mm -hmm. and, and why did, what's the purpose of the rest of the universe was kind of the second half of the question. Well, mm -hmm. uh, Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare, declare the, the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. And so God made everything that we see to blow us away with how insane he is and how huge he is. And like he literally just flicked his finger, he spoke a word, and like it all exploded into existence. And it's, it's crazy. You know, I, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I just get wrapped around these weird thoughts of like, man, we, we're on this like floating orb and like we're spinning around how many miles an hour? He actually knows. 22,000. Thank you. 22,000 miles an hour. And like we're sticking to this ball even though we're standing on it sideways. And I mean, there's giant floating balls of gas that are exploding, and there's black holes that suck things in and crush entire galaxies. I mean, how weird is this existence, you know? And it's, all you can say is, God, you're wonderful. You're amazing. You are so huge and so beyond what I could ever Amen. grasp. Amen. So. Dave. Yeah, so uh, my question is from uh, 2 Corinthians 12, uh, where Paul's talking about the thorn in his flesh. Like, what was the thorn? Like, a uh, it just says a messenger from Satan. What was the thorn in Paul's thorn, flesh? Thorn in Paul's flesh. Uh, we actually don't know. Um, there, there is a, a little bit of church history in some of the extra biblical writings and some of the early church accounts. Um, w when you look back, we, we have some sources that were very near the time of the apostles, but not exactly the time of the apostles. Um, Eusebius of Rome is one of those, and he seemed to indicate um, if you remember at the end of Paul's letters, you see with that which with large letters I write. And so it is believed that Paul suffered from uh, a disease that was common. Uh, remember, he transited through Pamphylia. Pamphylia had a lot of marshland there, and there was an eye disease uh, that was associated with a bacterium that was found there. And it was believed that Paul had uh, a, a very, very, very poor eyesight. And so uh, that would be a great hindrance to someone who was wandering around and had a subsistence living. And so that's the one thing that we do know, that it, it's pretty likely that he had very, very, very poor eyesight resulting from an eye disease. Yeah, I've heard that. I've, I've heard that maybe it was actually like a person who would just, you know, <laughs> oppose him constantly yeah, I've had a in few every city. From Satan. 
Yeah, <laughs> you have. Yeah. And, um, and I'm hopefully not one of them. No, not yeah, tonight. Okay, very good. <laughs> not tonight, he said. Um, and and uh, I think we don't know, um, but what Paul does say in this passage is the, the, you know, God allowed this to persist yeah. because God wanted to keep him humble and reliant on the Lord to do the work. You know, because Paul had these exceedingly great revelations, that's what it talks about, and he would have become prideful and boastful, and, and God allowed Satan, and again, this goes on to the first question where Satan has to operate under God's rule and reign and even permission. He can't do anything without permission. He's on a leash, uh, and you see that in the book of Job. Um, but this particular thorn in the flesh, Paul prayed, God, take this away, take this away. And God said, no, it's better that I leave it because then you're going to be reliant on me and then I can really work through you. And I think that's important for us to like, we have to stay humble and reliant on the Lord in all things or, or we'll become boastful. Well, and, and that's yeah. exactly why he said, and in, in, in my weakness, he is, he is made strong. Mm -hmm. he, our, our, our own human weakness makes us dependent and reliant upon the Lord. And I think None of us, while we're here on this earth, are ever going to experience earthly perfection. We'll all have our weaknesses and faults and things that uh, just leave us completely dependent on the work of the Lord in our lives. Cool. Got time for one more? All right. Yeah, I was asked uh, today at work, what was the purpose of uh, Melchizedek coming and meeting with Abraham? The purpose of Melchizedek, we covered this when we were... Uh, earlier in the book of Genesis, and, and Melchizedek is an interesting uh, picture, but as I shared with you then, and you can go online and actually get the, the whole story there, um, Melchizedek, I believe, is the first Christophany. Um, there are two types of appearances of, of God in both forms, the Godhead, Christ Jesus our Lord and, and God the Father, and this happens to be one where Melchizedek appears on the on the plains to Abraham, he brings with him the bread and the wine. Uh, we know nothing about his lineage, where he came from, where he went. Uh, he is worshipped, and so it's, it's pretty clear to me that this is an appearance of, of Jesus. He disappears from the scene, never to be uh, spoken of again. And then the writer of Hebrews picks up his story and says of Jesus, he is a priest likened unto that of Melchizedek. So, I think it's just simply to, to give us a picture. And it also brings forth the first issue of the, or the first usage of, the, of tithe, the uh, giving of the tenth. And so we know that that tithe belongs to the Lord. So here Abraham gives to Melchizedek the tithe, he receives from him uh, the bread and the wine. So it pretty much sounds like he's getting introduced uh, to Jesus there. Cool. Maybe we can just do one more text, and we'll do. We had a lot of theological ones. One practical one. All right. We'll a practical, okay, practical question. one is: um, if my husband wants to attend a Samoan church, do I have to go with him? I wouldn't really like to. So hopefully, I didn't spill the spill the beans for anybody. Um, but but that's a question. Uh, what if a husband and wife want to attend different churches? What are you, what's your opinion? Or it, maybe there's a scriptural point. This on that. is a tough one. Um, and, and I think that there are some subsequent questions that you need to ask there. Uh, the Bible pretty clearly uh, declares that there is an order and there is a headship. Um, it is a co-equal partnership wherein uh, the husband does not lord over the wife, but it is very clear that there is a level at which the wife is to sub subject herself to the leadership as unto the Lord. The Apostle Paul writes there in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, you're to submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And so uh, in that sense, the husband is supposed to be the spiritual head of the home. And when that spiritual head uh, is not in sin and not leading you away from the Lord, but towards the Lord, if he believes like he's heard uh, that you're supposed to attend, then you probably should have some conversations about that and at least see what the Lord will do by... Uh, attending one church rather than two. And here's the reason why. You know, if you're, if you're not fellowshipping in the same place, if you're not eating from the same table spiritually, if you're not getting the same food, uh, it, it, it is very, very tough to have the unity in the home that's supposed to come from that spiritual headship. And again, that's not lording over. That's not exerted power. That's death to self on the part of the husband. Um, but he, he should be able to make that, that spiritual 
uh, call in, in the family's life, and it, unless it's not of the Lord, and that would be the, the caveat there. Yeah, and I, there's a couple of verses that came to my mind about uh, the Bible talks about for the men to dwell with your wife in an understanding manner. Mm -hmm. um, it also talks that the men should sacrifice mm -hmm. for the wives to love her as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yes, there is headship and there is submission, and, and at the same time, the husband should want to uh, serve his wife as well. And so um, I think having a lot of conversations about is there a way for us to find a church that we both want to attend together? I think that's the key is that you want to be one, like you said, you're one flesh, so you want to go to one yeah. church and have one set of friends and get one set of teaching and all those things. There might, I mean, so my wife, she's a Russian, a native Russian, and so we met when I was in Russia, and sometimes she's like, I really miss Russian fellowship. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if she wants to go once a month to a Russian church, like, I don't see any problem as long as, like, this is our primary home sure. together, you know? And so I think there are some compromises you can make or maybe, like, I know some people who, like, they'll go to church together and then they'll go somewhere else that they both like and agree on in the evening at a different church, you know? Although that's kind of, I, I think it's important to pick a church and say, this is my family. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's a it's a that's a difficult question. You know, there, those are those are things that may not have a clear um, biblical answer beyond what I said, which is which is at some point in time, there has to be a final authority in every home. It's that simple. It's not a complex issue, and it's it's not a matter. Of, it it's when when we get into these things, it's just like was Jesus under submission of God the Father. The answer is yes. Did Jesus always will to do the will of God the Father? The answer is yes. And so here you have the picture of submission in the right way. Uh, there can't be two heads. Otherwise, you have, a, you have a bit of a hydra going on here, and you're going to be pulled in two different directions. And so as far as Scripture is concerned, um, as long as there's not a specific sin issue, in other words, the the husband wants to go to the first church of uh, Samoa Light with uh, Marijuana Tuesday, um, <laughs> then, you know, I, I, you're, you're going to have a tough time there as long as the word is being preached and as long as the gospel is being uh, taught. Uh, I think you, you kind of have to, at some point in time, there has to be a discussion. And if there must be a final decision, and again, Make sure that you understand what I'm saying here. There is not agreement. In other words, there, there are still two opinions, and neither of them are inherently sinful or against the word of the Lord. And hear me really clearly, the husband's supposed to make that final decision. Cool. All right, we're only 10 minutes over this time. That's our best yet. I know, right. we're doing good. <laughs> All right, it's time for prayer <laughs> and a jelly bean. There's, there's no licorice ones. Sorry. All right, just a prayer then. Father, thank you for this time. We pray that you would bless us. Lord, and as we go out, lead us with peace. Give us joy. Lord, give us a hunger for your word. Let us be Bereans. Uh, we're grateful for the time that we get to sit at your feet and just learn of you. And pray that you would use these things now to grow your church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, I think I found one. Good night, guys. On the bottom. <laughs>